Hello and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we meet with leaders from the world of business, finance and investing to understand the real impacts of COVID-19 on our economy, on our lifestyle and really on our investment strategy for the future. Now, my guest today runs a really interesting disruptive company in the house building sector. They combine modular construction, renewable energy and high technology into something they call Project Etopia. It's attracted investment from luminaries like our fellow Money and Me guest, Lord Stanley Fink, and also the world famous property investors, the Rubin Brothers. The name of the CEO of this company and my guest today is Joseph Michael Daniels. Joseph, welcome to Money and Me. Thank you very much, pleasure to be here. I'm glad, I'm glad that we can discuss all things property at this, at this difficult time of ours. Indeed, yes, and, and, and really let's, let's start with that because um, you know, this is an unprecedented uh, pandemic, but also government response to it in terms of practically shutting down the entire economy is unprecedented. What, what impact are you seeing on the property sector from the measures that have been taken? One of the things that we noticed that the initial impact point was a bit of uncertainty. Obviously, everyone was going through, what do we do next? We are in a very fortunate position where our system is, is, is modular in its approach. It's enabled us to take a bit of an alternative look. We don't have many overlaps. So whilst we immediately will let's analyze our internal resources and understand where we go as a hyperscaling startup, you know, we are one of the, the fastest hyperscaling and most in-demand startups in the country. How do we manage that first and foremost? Then after that um, kind of, you know, that storm, we then looked and saw what, what processes we could put in place. And the second that the government gave us that green light, we put in, you know, we put in processes on site, uh, extreme PPE requirement programs. But fundamentally, what that's enabled us to do is actually secure a sale and a move in over COVID, happy, safe. They live in a new, beautiful, smart eco building. Um, and they were able to get out of the previous accommodation they were locked within. And, and that's testament to the industry. However, I, there are a lot of people in the industry that aren't in the same position um, due to their methodologies. And it's, a, it's an uncertain time for all, but I think for construction and what it's gonna be, we're gonna see the resurgence after the World War, similar to that. And everyone, if you look, 88% uh, increase in, in, in viewership of homes. And we're looking at digital tools ourselves. So I think, I think this is going to create a resurgence in home ownership, which has been a bit lacking. But then I also think that the digital enablement of gaming engines and design and, and interacting with buildings in new ways and, and thinking about your home a lot more is going to come out the back of this. Um, and I think if there is any good to come out of it, hopefully that people with that lifestyle approach are thinking more about it, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that, that there's been a, a, a real chance for people to pause and reflect on their whole lifestyle and a lot of people now are thinking i really want that you know 60 minute commute on a crowded tube train would, would i rather not work from home most of the week perhaps further away from a, the city center and just accept that i'll drive in or whatever once or twice a week and i guess this would, would play into this idea of, of, of creating new um, you know, modular developed in developments in attractive countryside location. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, we at Utopia, we're a bit of a unique, we're a bit of a unique beast. And I imagine we'll come on to what Utopia is in a minute, in, in a minute. but we as an organization, we're not just a modular builder, you know, we're an Eki tech company with energy construction and intelligent technology. We combine different technologies to build assets and these assets build the communities we live in. And so what we're seeing and what we've learned, even in recent years before COVID, there was a pattern of people wanting to be able to work and live comfortably, but in more remote locations, but also with placemaking in mind, not these dense built urban environments that we see today that are all mimicked. So when we were looking at it, we were looking at the versatility of how can you have a building system, no matter if it's a school or a house, how can it always perform, but also how can it be versatile enough that the consumer can have its flair and customization? And how then can you use green credentials to put it in locations that wouldn't be classified for these urban built environments? What about the countryside where you can build greener and you make more green within the building? So you're getting double the asset, you're getting the user of that countryside green living. And 
we've noticed a trend in this and we see a pattern going forward that people now with COVID, maybe they want to get out. They could just said, maybe they don't want that commute. We can do it digitally. So maybe people are going to start to invest in more in their communities, more in their local parks, more in how their houses are, are fixed and orientated and how that interacts with the community. Um, and that's going to be a real step change, I think. I think it's going to be both for, for us as, as people, consumers, um, but also for policymakers and planners looking at what a garden village is really mean and, and things like that and, and helping people understand what they're, what they're buying rather than just buying a house. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to see some changes in behaviour for sure. We're already hearing about quite a few large companies that want their staff to, to work from home more. Um, and in fact, one of my own neighbours here works for a big oil company and they've said they're getting rid of their big head office and 80% of staff working from home. Facebook have said a similar thing. So uh, there's clearly going to be a market for this. Um, I mean, is there a particular kind of person or kind of demographic that you find uh, uh, is most attracted to the sorts of modular developments and, and these rural locations that you're talking about? You'd be surprised. I think the generational gap has somewhat been sealed, in a sense, from the ability of communication and technology. So, ironically, when you expect we're building a smarter home, um, we're partnered with world tech giants, that it wouldn't be necessarily functional for, for people uh, of the older generation. However, because of the versatility of our floor plan, um, one of our lifts at Corby, uh, one of our houses at Corby has a lift in it, and it's for downsizers. Um, what we're doing is we're building built, building built environments with technology enablement. And so it doesn't matter if you're, you're an older person that doesn't necessarily want to be hiking up and down stairs or doesn't want to be, you know, I, I have an autoimmune condition, I have arthritis in my bones. It's a nightmare once you're settled down to then getting up and light and light on and off. So actually, what about just simplicity? What about intelligent simplicity? And what we're seeing actually is that all generations are adopting this we've got in one of our show homes kids writing we love this house because it's beautiful it's airy and you know kids pick up on these senses when there's extra air and oxygen in the room you don't notice people that are younger generation love the eco they love that we've broken the epc rating with a tesla of housing they love that they can do what they want with their house and, and it can be technological with no carbon guilt but then older generations also like the freedom and the open space it provides and the ability to have ease of access and ease of functionality um, and our goal, you know, a part of the utopia, utopia stands for economic environment of utopia as a part of those, you know, economic, scalable, affordable, environmental, sustainable, there's also socially acceptable. So everything that we designed in this system is to fit across a range of people. And we've seen, we've seen reflection on that in our audience, really. It's, it's been a mixed bag. Um, and I'm glad that people of all ages are thinking about the same unit, but in a different way and a different usage purpose. But ultimately, it's that home that, that, that they want. Okay, and I think what's particularly of interest to me is that you've attracted uh, people of the caliber of, of Lord Stanley Fink and the Rubin brothers, who are all obviously already very big players in the in the real estate world. What was it about the whole Etopia approach that made them want to get on board with this kind of more disruptive approach to the world of building homes and living spaces and even cities? Well, I think you know these these gentlemen are of the smartest, most intelligent and, 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 and most and actually most kind people you'll ever meet. And they've seen it at every level, whether it's commodities trading, stocks, you know, uh, all these different areas. And I think what they saw in us was, was they saw in me was something a little bit different. I from homeless background, I suffered, you know, extreme ill upbringing. Um, and I was on a guy on a journey that wanted to build things to the right purpose. However, I added to the environment of utopia i added the economics i understood the world goes round we had to be scalable we had to be affordable you know i understood that we have to provide solutions in products that last the test of time for people that want it so that the commercial reality of, of building can work not in a damaging way that it has been in some cases but in a good but then add that technology combination. We are the first Echi Tech company, as I mentioned. You know, we're energy, construction, intelligent technology. And I think what they saw was a bit of a step change. They didn't just see NMC. They didn't just see construction. They saw placemaking. They saw how I built schools and homes. They saw how by just making these more comfortable for people, people will be happier and you'll be able to provide more for the same amount of real estate, but in a way that's ready and future-proof for the next generations. And by listening to them and taking on their wisdom and taking on their advice, we are now you know, 
accelerating. Had already built, you know, the shanty town, shanty replacement unit in Namibia, which is a you know a groundbreaking phenomenon that we have been featured in the UN 75th anniversary for. But also the commercial increase, the scalability. We're working, you know, in the Middle East, in the US. And it's by listening and learning from these individuals that I'm fortunate enough to have on my my board and, and advise me that I am able to make real change through an idea and an invention that was invented to make the world a better place, if that makes sense. But also make it real, you know, get that knowledge to make it a real thing, not just an idea. Okay. I think one of the traits of successful entrepreneurs is that they, they, they have something that's kind of driving them on. And I think in your case, it was perhaps this more challenging start that you had in life. Just tell us a little bit more about your own background, yeah, um, I, without going into too much detail, there's some other podcasts that do. But, um, you know, I was homeless at 15 years old. My mother, unfortunately, um, the section, my father was an abusive alcoholic. My mum suffered severe mental illness at the hands of, of an abusive alcoholic father. And, you know, it it was horrible. And I went sofa surfing, then homeless. And I've been homeless four times. And for me, it drove something in me where I had... An unfortunate you know suicide attempt um when i was 21 and it, it, it didn't it didn't work and I, I turned to myself and said look let's do something real with this you know let's let's try and do something and it was that kind of pain and suffering that makes me reflect on what is hard and difficult and what is required in life and do you know what that is a home do you know it's a home it's a school where the teachers can spend more time with the pupils because the environment's better it's not paying a pound for a pen or over the odds for a school classroom because they should be essential it's not paying for energy bills where we ran out of gas and electric because the landlord wouldn't change the single glazed windows it wasn't going and staying in one of these halfway houses that's a new built unit but it felt like a concrete cell and that drove me to wanting to make change and then I took myself on an explorative journey. Fortunately, I, I, I did learn things very quickly. At school, I was very disruptive and might have been part of my character, but all the upbringing that I was in. But as I matured, I realized that I could learn things. And that combination of learning and listening with that hunger and, and that knowledge of what really difficulty is has driven me into, into places that, you know, I, someone of my upbringing never thought they would be. And hopefully that will... Um, inspire others in a sense as well to show them that I'm self-taught in that architecture, agriculture, um, mechanical engineering, electrical and engineering, gaming engine design, web design, thermodynamics. I'm inventing things and it's, it's off the web and it's self-hungry. It's that, that passion, you know, um, and, and hopefully people find that passion in the things that they, they find hard that, that drives them. So, so I mean, just to put that in context, what we're saying is within two years of, of trying to take your own life, you actually founded this company and, and, and then it's gone on, obviously, to attract global investors and now you're working on, on several continents. So t tell us a little bit now about, you know, you're obviously not, not lacking in ambition or vision here. So tell us a bit about the, um, this idea you have for creating garden cities with this technology. Yes. Yeah, so... The principles of building the perfect building or built environment means that we can build anything, you know, schools, healthcare centers, you know, and we're also able to look at how these, each of these building blocks, how do they benefit or use the infrastructure? So can they power cars? Can we make highways smarter for autonomous vehicles? Can they be charged by the homes? By doing this and understanding the principles of the energy and the construction and the intelligent parts of this, it's enabled us to start putting together a blueprint and a master plan around how garden villages are. We've all heard garden villages, you know, um, Gordon Brown's first one in 2008. We've all heard about garden village. What does a garden village really mean? And what does a garden city mean? And so now by delivering these different types of units and bringing them together in good placemaking, good urban environments, we can now look at how we build them all around the world. So we're building in the Middle East and we're building a home, which is a, you know, a beautiful Middle Eastern designed home that's going to be a part of a bigger plan of building a community in the desert. We're built in Namibia where we're looking at revamping the units of the shanty towns that will rebuild the economy in these localized areas, but also then them learning how to construct the middle income housing. Working in the United States and understanding all these different areas of, of, of single family homes and mobile homes and how do we how do we replace those and build build the infrastructure using the units. That enables us to start looking at how do we build more and how do we manufacture cities. Um, and that is a part of the journey that we're on now to, to, to 
going global with the system, globalizing the building regulation, as it were, showing it works everywhere, no matter where you are, and then putting these pieces together in a way that builds communities of the future. And I think you, you, you've either already achieved or you're well on the way towards achieving a, a, an official certification about just how energy efficient these homes are. Yeah, yeah, we're in the midst at the moment of um, working collaboratively with um, some of the biggest organization bodies in the world that will hopefully, using us as an evidence point, prove that the house in Namibia will outperform any house in the UK. So to put that in perspective, the houses we built at Corby were 10 times the air tightness and performance of a building regulation built building in the UK. So what you classify as a traditional standard new home. Not only that, the EPC uh, certificate you see on your fridges, you know, you get the A ratings on the AED. The EPC on our homes came in at an average of 103. We broke the EPC mold. Now, normal homes are built to a 60, which is a D, most new homes. What we did is we took that ability to build that here in the UK, and then we showed that that same thing can be exported and built in Africa. And that, what that does is it shows that we are basically creating different shapes and styles of homes that can be customized. But by providing that core elements, those core essentials, we're able to distribute it anywhere in the world and therefore guarantee the quality being built to a new level anywhere in the world we go. Okay, fantastic. Well, if we come back to the UK market, um, you know, if you, if you look at all the, the grey hair in front of you, a lot of that has come from dealing with UK planning departments who seem determined to delay and prevent as much development as possible. Now, you're talking about building potentially in the green belt. So, you know, what sort of reaction are you getting from local authority planners to the idea that, that this kind of garden city should be implanted into what's traditionally been a no-go area for property development? I think that there's a few layers to that. There's, there's the first layer of, we, you know, we, we want to approach the, the brownfield first and foremost. You know, we're, we're tackling that. So let's take this land that's not being really used and let's make it fit for purpose and give it some homes. Then there's the reality where we've done analysis in the UK. We're in a four million housing deficit. We're building less than 300,000 a year. COVID's now here. We're building substandard in what we should be building. So there's an increase in required. And there's a population growth. We've at Topia have done analysis and data that basically in, in the next 10 years, there's just not going to be enough houses. So what we need to do, I think, is socially and responsibly understand that the areas that we're trying to not building, if they're planned ahead of time correctly, you can, you can build on them. So we've developed a tool called Project Gateway. Um, that tool is, it uses our build systems and types and you can go on a, G, a Google map and any planner can go on it and they can start massing out potential sites of the future. It saves them a lot of money. And then what that should do is you should open up, uh, you know, planned properly and performance based with green criteria, with green credentials in areas that they would have said no before. You know, our house, if you look at the carbon on the house, because it's energy positive at Corby, it's the equivalent of planting 2.3 hardwood trees for one square meter of space for 25 year mortgage life. So actually, if you built our houses, and then put green landscape on top of an apartment block. It would be better than having the green belt land. But we have to make sure that the consumers and the lifestyle and that, that, that garden approach is not diminished. It can't just be a housing estate. It has to be unique. It has to be different. And I think the only way we're going to achieve this is by working with the planners and saying, no, no, we know you've heard all the negative stuff from code. You know, code got abolished. We know you've had all the dramas and the issues. We are the people telling you and showing you that we can deliver these things. So how do we work with you to give you what you or local district want in a way that's planned ahead of time, not reactive because of the housing crisis and we end up losing the green belt to some messy development because we just need houses in 10 years, you know? And I think it's a step chain for all of us. It's learning, you know, it's, 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 it's proving, I suppose. Uh, I guess one of the things you can leverage in those discussions is that you already have involvement from a, a government department that's uh, become quite excited about what you're doing, particularly from this kind of green and energy efficient uh, aspect. Yeah, we work with, you know, we're working with the people that know, you know, we're working with the Town and County Planning Association, Town and County Planning Association. We're working with the UK Business Council for Sustainable Development. We've met with the British Property Federation. We're working so closely and we've built an energy positive building at the building research establishment. They've got 100 years of data and 26 million of housing data and they build all over the world and they're our legacy. 
So what we're doing is we're working directly with these guys to say, okay, how do we make this work? And these, these individual sectors are now, I suppose, proving not just to us, but to governments as well, that it can be done. And that's going to hopefully reassure more and more district councils, more and more local councils that they can have access. You know, we're not a developer that's coming like the rest of them and saying, give us that plot of land. Okay, we'll put an option on it. We're the developer that's coming saying, how do we build with you? How do we provide you a solution that you can build what you need in a green way where everybody wins? And we don't, we don't just maximize the future of people's lives for just profit. We do it in a way that's thought out. We do it in a way that's best for everyone. Okay, well, I, I recently interviewed uh, Claire Barrett from the Financial Times, and, and she said that what she thinks is one of the um, trends that will emerge from COVID-19 is a big increase in, in what you could generically call green investing and interest in green investments because of this uh, uh, you know, renewed interest in the environment. So I guess in terms of the, the consumers, the people who would be buyers of these homes, um, you're, you're going to be kind of pushing against an open door and, and, and able to leverage that trend towards uh, making a very uh, environmentally friendly choice of where you're going to live. Yeah, and if we look at the macroeconomics of this and you look, break it down, you know, not from the people that have got lots of money to invest. If you're going to invest in a property, you're going to pay for 25 years. Invest in yourself. And if ESGs and the green investments are the best to make, buying a home that will either be net zero or not cost you bills is an investment in yourself. As an evidence point, £1,200 a year's average on bills. Well, we can get rid of that. So over the 25 years, you save that. Also, because your house is an EPC rating above an A, we know that in places like Exeter, it increases the value by 14000 against conventional. But we sell at the same price traditional. So what we're saying is more on a macro level is that by buying the home, you're investing in your own energy. You're investing in your own life. And you're investing in something that's, that's future proof, if that makes sense. And therefore, you've got an asset that appreciates with you, which should then open their eyes to how do we get involved in green? How do we organize waste better? How do we you know, and get people on that pathway to product development through consumerism around green? You know, as we've seen with Coca-Cola changing, trying to change their bottles. You know, how do we as consumers, as people drive that change? in those investment areas, like you say, and hopefully not only will we open the physical door <laughs> to that, we're opening a theoretical door as well as to saying, well, why can't every consumer that's bought a green home invest in green, green products and technology? Okay, so as we come towards the end of our time together, Joseph, what, 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 what does success look like for you? What, what, what do you? What's gonna make you sit back and think, yes, I've really kind of achieved what I set out to achieve? When the global standard of housing is increased, and we've used it as a benchmark, the same way Tesla has proven to the automobile industry. And beyond my own existence, there will be a legacy of children being born into a comfortable, oxygenated, non-pressurized home in places, in slums, as well as in cities. I would achieve my personal goal of hopefully, hopefully making a big enough impact where the homes will be homes and not just products for profit. And they will be focused on lifestyle and people to create better lives for the next generation. That, that for me is the picture of success. Fantastic. Well, we all wish you every success in achieving that. Joseph Daniels, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much.